Welcome, everybody. Welcome to our Life Science Cafe for this month. Uh, my name is Louise McCormick, and I am a PhD student in the Organismal and Evolutionary Biology Program at UMass Amherst. And I am your MC for tonight's cafe. Um, just to give you a little bit of background on our group, Life Science Cafe was established in 2011 and is organized by graduate student researchers at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. Each month, we invite speakers to share and discuss their research. We would like to thank our funding sources, the Organismal and Evolutionary Biology Program, the Graduate Student Senate, and the Graduate School at UMass, the National Science Foundation, and our generous UMass Gifts donors. If you'd like, you can subscribe to our mailing list and stay tuned for our future cafes. We're also now hosting our events hybrid to benefit both of our virtual and in-person viewers. In addition, we're also trying to make our events more accessible which includes having closed captioning and events in other languages. If there's anything that you feel would improve our accessibility of events, please feel free to let me know. So with that, uh, today, I have the pleasure of introducing Dr. Kristen DeAngelis. Dr. DeAngelis is a professor at UMass Amherst. Um, she received her bachelor's degree from Harvard University and her PhD from UC Berkeley. She then went on to do postdoctoral work at the Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory, as well as the Joint Bioenergy Institute. Uh, today, she's gonna to talk to us about all of the dirty details of soil microbial ecology and climate change. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me. Uh, so first in our kind of first vignette, uh, we're gonna go through a little bit about your system. Um, so first, if you could tell us what is microbial ecology? So first of all, thank you for having me. Um, so microbial ecology, um, microbial ecology is the study of microbes in their natural environment. So um, our world is a microbial one. Microbes were here first. Um, maybe the first organisms on earth. Um, we all grew up sort of in this wash of microbes. Um, oh, okay. And so um, a lot of microbiology and biology studies microbes in the lab, and, and our lab is really interested in studying microbes, sort of how they, they interact in their natural environment. So what are the things that um, change community structures? Why do some organisms show up at some places than others? Why does activity change? Um, that's basically the idea. Okay, so before we go any further, what the heck is a microbe? Oh my God. So, uh, a microbe is any organism you can't see. Does everybody know that there are three domains of life? There's eukarya, there's all of us. Um, there's archaea, which are the most sort of primitive forms of life, um, and the bacteria. And they are the most diverse by quite a lot. Um, and so there are, are most, most of the eukarya, all of the archaea, and almost all of the bacteria you can't see. So if you need a microscope to see it, it's a microbe. Perfect. Why should we care about these organisms? Oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> um, so microbes are everywhere and they do things in the environment. So for example, um, a lot of folks here are eating food um, and our food um, first goes into our stomachs. That's where you get the nutrients, but you can't digest a lot of the kinds of nutrients that are in your food. We rely on microbes to break up fiber and make sure chain fatty acids, and those are essential nutrients. Soils, which we study, are microbial kind of superorganisms. They're alive. If you didn't have microbes in soil, it wouldn't be soil. The microbes make nutrients available for plants. Um, they filter our water. Um, so people maybe think that trees are a source of oxygen in our atmosphere. That's true, but the major source is microbes in the ocean. Um, so they're really kind of doing all of this kind of processing of our nutrients um, and as well as making us sick and stuff like that. Totally, totally. So your work looks a little bit at the genome of microbes. Could you give us a little bit of a background on what that looks like in layman's terms? Yeah, so um, all organisms have a genome. It's your DNA, and that's kind of the your potential. Of the different kinds of things that we do. And so I mentioned that the bacteria are super diverse 
And so that means that they have a super diverse kind of set of things they can do. They can eat way more kinds of food. They can breathe way more kinds of things. Like we're limited to oxygen and they can breathe manganese and iron and uh, sugars and all of this other stuff. And so um, the genome tells you what is the potential, what kinds of things can an organism do. So what does it mean to sequence a genome? So when we sequence a genome, um, we extract the DNA from our organism and um, we put it on an instrument that will tell us um, what are the different base pairs. So A, S, G, C, and T's. Um, bacterial genomes are one to 10 million bases. Uh, fun fact, our genomes are like a hundred or a thousand times larger, but we have the same number of genes. We all have about two to 4,000 genes. Um, and so we get all those A's, G's, T's, and P's. So you can imagine like one sentence or like one word really that goes on for 10 million letters, all A's, G's, T's, and T's. So that's the sequencing part. If you're lucky, you get one word that's 10 million uh, letters long. Sometimes you get multiple words. That's okay. Um, and then uh, we do something called annotation, where we take that one big word, uh, that's the genome, and we kind of break it up and say, you know, where are the functional genes? What are the regulatory elements? What are other things um, that are going on? So that's kind of how we get the information about what organisms are doing, that annotation. Cool. Very, very cool. So now we're going to zoom out just a little bit. Um, how are our soils and the atmosphere connected? And how does that play into your work? Yeah, so um, actually, I'm going to show a picture. I brought some slides. Cool. Um, okay, so this is a picture of the carbon cycle. Yeah, that's okay. You can still keep the captions. Um, yeah, so this is a picture of the carbon cycle. This shows so it's terrestrial on the left and aquatic on the right. And uh, this kind of shows where the carbon is moving. So all elements, carbon, nitrogen, even water, have cycles. They move through these reservoirs. Um, and I'm interested in soil because it, because it relates to the carbon cycle and the atmosphere. So you can see in the different areas, there are numbers. Um, and those are the gigatons of carbon that are in each of those reservoirs. So for example, you can see that microbes respire um, uh, a number that's like 60, so that's 60 gigatons per year. Plants respire about 60 gigatons per year. So that's CO2 going into the atmosphere. That's greenhouse gases. But plants are photosynthesizing that exact number. It's not a coincidence. So that they're in balance. The problem is this nine gigatons of human emissions of CO2 that we're putting out through burning fossil fuels. So we're not going to solve the human emissions problem with our science, but we can better understand what are these microbial feedbacks to the climate system in the soil. Um, and if climate warming is going to sort of change that balance of carbon going in through plants, sort of fixing carbon and carbon coming out through microbes eating food and respiring some carbon as CO2. That is so cool. That is so cool. So you kind of mentioned that there are these reservoirs or ways that carbon can be stored. Could you talk a little bit more about what that means? Yeah, so people think about the carbon cycle as sort of having these pools and fluxes. So soil is a major, major reservoir of carbon. Some carbon in the soil just doesn't, um, doesn't get lost, doesn't get lost as CO2. And this is a, an active area of research right now. And actually we have a new project trying to understand why does some carbon stay in the soil and some leaves? And maybe it seems like I don't know if it seems um, like you can't picture what it would look like for carbon to be in the soil, but I'm sure you can. Imagine a very rich soil that is dark and it smells wonderful. 
um, the darker a soil is, the more carbon it's storing. Um, and so having plants growing in soil is one way to enrich carbon into the soil because the plants encourage microbial growth and they fix carbon and put that in as food exudates. Um, That's awesome. So sorry, I didn't. didn't no, no. Um, what was the question? Um, <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're asking me about carbon storage, carbon storage in soil, or what it looks like for carbon to be stored in Yeah, like it's just, yeah. yeah, just kind of trying to get a sense of like how it works. I mean, we could join my one. <laughs> you know, I think that's kind of what we're trying to understand is like, how, how does it work? Um, there is carbon in certain places, and we don't exactly understand why. I mean, some ideas are simple, like. If you want more carbon in soil, you plant plants, maybe plant more native plants, uh, maybe encourage them to grow, plant the right plant in the right place. Um, more healthy soils tend to have plants growing in them. They have more microbes. Um, but the question and kind of where we're coming in with our research is trying to understand as the climate changes, some of these rules are changing terms of why carbon gets stored in certain places than others. So a lot of labs are, are trying to understand this, this question. Awesome. I think that's helpful. And I think it's also nice to kind of think about the fact that we as scientists, we don't have all the answers. That's part of why we're doing our job. So I think that's that was really helpful. Um, how does the carbon that's stored in the soil end up affecting our climate? Well, I mean, in one way, so soil is a possible like natural climate mitigation. So it's not going to be a solution. The solution is to stop burning fossil fuels. Um, but storing more carbon in the soil will protect soil for all of the other kinds of, of good things that soils do. So sometimes people talk about um, natural things like soils as having uh, properties that are called ecosystem services. I don't know if you've heard of that word, ecosystem services. It's a very kind of uh, uh, anthropomorphic, human-centered idea that like soils are doing things for us as people. We need special things, right? Microbes can live everywhere in the Arctic, in the bottom of the ocean. We have very specific requirements. We need pizza and also it has to be hot. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, so, um, so part of what um, we are trying to do is understand like, what are the ecosystem services that soils provide um, and make those sort of encourage those. So um, healthy soils that have a lot of carbon um, are not going to erode as easily. Um, healthy soils that have a lot of carbon are going to have make plants that have more biomass and make more fruits and vegetables. Uh, maybe they'll make more flowers to encourage pollinators and, and build up food webs, um, things like that. Yeah, okay. So one other thing that you're working on is you're studying some of the evolution of, of microbes, um, something that we'll talk a little bit more about in the next vignette. But um, before we do that, how can you tell whether a microbe is evolving? And what does microbial evolution even look like? Well, we, we, we have tricks. <laughs> We're using tricks to try and understand. So yeah, how do you know if an organism is evolving? So um, when an organ so the when an organism evolves, it uh, changes its genetic composition in some kind of way so that it has a new function. Usually, it's because it has a higher fitness; it can grow better, or it can make more babies. Just and with microbes, it just makes more microbes. Um, and uh, so we, we kind of take two approaches, which one is we look for evidence of adaptation where we take a big collection of microbes, we question them for some kind of behavior, like um, can they eat cellulose? But then maybe we'll ask that of hundreds of organisms. Um, and then we map those traits on a phylogenetic tree 
And part of the way you can understand evolution is by kind of uh, reconstructing ancestral traits using phylogeny. By and so that's just a it's just an idea that if you make a phylogenetic tree, um, that you can kind of infer what ancestral organisms would have looked like. Um, it's just a model. It's just an idea. And then we use our genome sequencing to try and see if those changes were heritable and what they would have looked like. Yeah, I think that's that's really helpful. So we're at the end of the net one at this point. And so now I'd like to open it up to our audience to see if they've got any questions for you. Yeah, Jennifer. Yes. So I'm sort of back when you said that we breathe oxygen, but microbes can breathe iron and other types. So what does breathe mean in that sense? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Can I repeat the question for yes. a second? So the gist of the question was <laughs> talking earlier about how microbes can breathe things other than oxygen. What does that mean? How do they do that? Yes, it's such a good question. Thanks for asking. So um, when we breathe oxygen, it's called respiration. That's the actual like scientific term. You inhale O2 into your lungs and um, you have uh, molecules in or, or enzymes in your lungs that take that oxygen and put electrons on them. You get energy from that. That's your breathing oxygen. You're putting your extra electrons on the oxygen and reducing it. And so microbes can do that too, but they can put their extra electrons on oxygen and, and that's very profitable. And most bacteria are able to use oxygen, um, but they can also use other things um, like hydrogen sulfide or iron. Um, and that's just put you putting the electrons onto something else. And it is very weird because those things are insoluble. So maybe they need to be touching them or they need to have a pili that attaches to those things. Yeah. Yes. So it's one of the things that you were studying um, about the evolution was what happens under the warming conditions. That's what I remember. Yes. Did you find an answer? And <laughs> <laughs> so the question is, um, what are are you studying whether microbes how they change, evolve, how they change under how they warming change and in, have you in, found a warming, in a warming soil? Not like Centralia, the person that's here before you used to go, you know, you know what Centralia is? Yeah. It's this coal burning fire in Pennsylvania oh, like, oh, that's been going for 25 years. So he used to go down and study warming soil there, but he left those years. No, I didn't ever find out. <laughs> um, I think that this is what we were going to talk about next is the long term. Warming yes, system. we're definitely going to yeah. talk more about it <laughs> for sure. Hang tight. <laughs> <laughs> I've been hanging tight with you. <laughs> You're so close. You're so close to finding out. Yes. Looking at your figure up here, it makes me wonder um, how important is soil erosion to carbon deposition? Oh, how important is soil erosion to carbon flux? Well, first of all, this this is the Department of Energy's idea of the carbon cycle. This is not my idea. Um, but so, how important is? Well, it depends on your frame of reference. Um, if you're a farmer or you're interested in the carbon cycling on your land, I would imagine erosion is a real big problem because you're losing your soil. And I know that soil erosion um, is, a, is a big problem in agricultural systems. In terms of the global carbon balance, I think it's probably a positive because if the soil erodes, then it moves down into the bottom of lakes and oceans and that carbon gets stuck down there. Because the deep ocean has quite a lot of carbon and underneath the um, closed captioning, is, there's a fossil carbon, but even subsurface, there's a ton of carbon down there. So burying carbon very deep in the soil is one of the like more, um, how should we say, uh, risky ideas maybe that people have in terms of mitigating this human carbon emissions. Um, 
because how if you put something down into the ground, how do you know it's going to stay there? It's very difficult to know. Yes. Yeah, as a farmer, we look at it as the carbon and the microbes create aggregates, so like little marbles that make it so water can infiltrate, and so you don't have that. And when it can infiltrate, it won't flood, which means it won't carry away our topsoil. And of course, then that yields to microbial necromass, which is the carbon that we're really looking for in the soil. But I have a question because we've been finding out recently by Dr. James White about rhizophage recycling of a plant, where it takes in, it ranches bacteria around the root tip and then sucks it into the root tip, dissolves the nutrients off of the shell, decides whether it's a type of bacteria it really wants to maintain or not, and then shoots it out the root hair. That's the purpose he found out of a root hair, and then reforms it again grow it out again and recycle it around, which is a major source of nutrients. What we're trying to understand that I didn't know if you might, but we've heard that the plant can actually change some of the DNA of that microbe when it shoots it out. So when it grows up, it'll be more adapted to whatever resource it's try, that microbe's trying to take, whether it be zinc or boron or whatever. And the exudate feeds it can then make it more compatible. But I don't know if you know That's anything about rhizo. what is it called? Rhizo? Rhizophagy cycling. Yeah, Dr. Wow. James White out of record figured out about maybe four or five years ago now. And farmers have gotten because then we can really focus on keeping those that microbial area around the roots, you know, really healthy and structured keep that cycling going, which can reduce our nutrients and mineral use by a tremendous amount. Anything else? Yeah. Thank you all so much. Um, with that, we're going to go ahead and move into our second vignette, and um, we're going to dig a little deeper, if you'll pardon my pun, uh, into some of your work and what you're doing. Um, so if you could talk just in kind of a general overview sense, what is the focus of your lab and your personal research? So, so the purpose of our lab is um, we're interested in the um, microbiology of climate change. How is climate affecting microbes? And how can we kind of use that understanding to try and make some um, tools uh, like um, biofuels or microbes that can uh, improve biofuels to help mitigate climate change. And you have some very hot off the press research that just came out this, this month. That's right. Um, that's kind of about some sort of microbe adaptation to warming climates. Could you give us a little bit of a summary on that? Yeah. So, um, so let's see, maybe I'll start at the beginning um, since we have time. So the, the picture that's on the screen now is of the um, Harvard Forest, which is in Petersand, Massachusetts, just right off of the Quaggan Reservoir. And um, this 4,000 acre experimental forest, it's like a um, picture like a national park, but it's set aside for research instead of for recreation, although it is open for recreation and anybody can go out to the Harvard Forest and hike around and they have a wonderful museum and you can walk by all of these experiments that are happening out there. And so um, I came to UMass in 2011. And when I came to UMass in 2011, um, I was introduced to Jerry Melillo and Street of Fry who had set up these experiments. I'm not a field biologist. Um, but um, I love working with them. And so they set up this field experiment. It's a long-term warming study where the idea is um, they wanted to sort of look into the future of climate change to try and understand like, what are soils going to look like if we were living in say a five degrees above ambient trajectory. At the time, this was a worst case scenario. 
Um, we are cruising towards five degrees at a clip that is pretty frightening. Um, and soils, especially, one of the things that they do is they serve as sort of a buffer. Um, and so the soil temperature doesn't change as much as the air temperature. So soil degree, five degrees of warming in soil is quite extreme. You can see maybe there are two experiments. There are these large plots that are on the left and then small plots on the right. So the large plots on the left, that's the warming study that was part of this um, Mallory Shador's paper that, that I shared with you. Um, this is uh, experiment has warming treatment. So there are these six meter by six meter plots. Um, there are six replicates of them and they're heated through these buried heated resistance cables. Um, I don't know if anybody here watches football. Do you ever see a football game on TV? And, and like maybe the Green Bay Packers are playing and snow is like driving down and it's collecting on everybody's hats and the field is green. Yeah. This is the same technology. Actually, Jerry was a, well, he was a, a not a professional football player, but so, uh, so this is the same technology. There are these heating cables that are buried 10 centimeters deep and every, I don't remember, like 10 centimeters or so, there's something called a thermistor, and that's just a fancy word for a thermometer that's connected to a computer. And so there's a shed with a computer and a data logger, and in some of the later pictures, you'll see the, the shed where the, all the electrical is. And every five minutes, um, this computer takes the temperature of the control plots, which have these buried cables, but they're not heated, and then puts enough resistance through the heated plots to heat them five degrees above ambient, whatever ambient is. So this has been running since 1991. Um, I know, so cool. I was in high school. Like I was even thinking, I didn't know what a micro was in the high school. So I love that I get to work here. It's such a privilege. And so what Jerry's group has been doing, um, and now Sarita's group, is kind of following this trajectory of what is happening in the soil over this amount of time. So um, this picture shows a close-up of one of the plots. There are six replicate heated plots. And maybe you can see in the background, so the, do I have a pointer too? I think that is a pointer. It works. Oh, wait, there, there. Okay, so this is the heated plot, right? You can see the outline. And then this is a control plot. It still has snow. So I like this because it kind of gives you a sense of, of, of the scale of this. Um, we don't sample in winter though, the ground is frozen. So, <laughs> but I like this because it, you can really see the effect of the warming. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so what types of differences did you then observe between that heated soil type and the control soil microbes? So, when I, so when I got to UMass, it was 2011 and it had been what, like 20 years. And um, Jerry and Sarita were noticing that it, the soils were just hemorrhaging carbon. So a lot more CO2 coming out of these heated plots than the control. And I know there's a bunch of scientists in the crowd. And so you know that like if you heat any biological system, the metabolism is just going to go a little faster. So that's a, not that unexpected. What was strange and what got me involved was that this carbon loss was not linear. It wasn't like they heated and then every year there was more and more. They heated it in 1991 and for about eight years there was every year there was more. And then for like another eight years, um, there was no more treatment effect. Right, this was Jerry's face. <laughs> How could there be no shooting effect? And so then they started trying to think of like, what could be happening that we're heating these soils, uh, the kinetic effect isn't working anymore. And so they came up with some ideas about like, maybe all the food is gone, uh, the food for the microbes, um, maybe they've adapted. And, and that was true that the microbial communities changed. Um, but if all the food was gone, how did that explain phase three when the uh, heating caused sort of another burst of carbon loss for another like six years? And so that's when we started thinking like something's going on where maybe the microbes are stressed 
And then these periods when it's not, where there's not this warming effect, it was some kind of change happening in the microbial community. And it was sort of having these thoughts is when I came in to the project. I was a new assistant professor and I was looking for something fun. And this is a great group of people in the Harvard Forest, just like a wonderful resource, um, a lot of great scientists, a great network. Um, and so we started working on, on this project and trying to understand. So, you know, the short story is these soils over 30 years have lost a third of their carbon. One third. It's really nuts. And um, there, so there's a lot less carbon. Because they have so much less carbon, they don't hold water as well. So they experience drought more often. It's also changed just how they look. Um, I don't know if you've ever dug a hole in a forest around here, but there's this really thick organic layer. It's like a, it's like a, like a rug, like a mat, um, and you can actually kind of lift the whole thing up. It's, it's like a net that's connected of fine roots um, and fungal hyphae and decaying leaf litter, and then underneath that is the mineral soil. And that's where the, the soil minerals are and all that other organics. There's micro with all of that. And so this organic horizon has shrunk. And in some parts of these warming plots, they're actually bare. Um, has anyone had the pleasure of visiting a tropical rainforest? I highly recommend. But if you look on the ground in a tropical rainforest, there's no organic layer the leaf litter decomposes so fast that you see the mineral surface on the ground looks just red all around. And that's what it's starting to look like in patches. We're just losing this organic layer. So the first thing we did was we looked for at the community ecology. We thought, let's, you know, let's see if the communities have changed and maybe there's less microbes. Well, the communities changed a lot for the fungi and not a lot for the bacteria. And the biomass decreased a lot for the fungi and not at all for the bacteria. And so that's when I started thinking like, well, if there's the same number of microbes and the environment is so different um, and seems like it's more stressful, there's less food, there's less water, like that's pretty objectively more stressful, even for bacteria, which can do all kinds of things. So that's when we thought we should start looking at adaptation. Wow, that's amazing. It's so interesting. Um, so you kind of looked at the genomic signatures of all of these bacteria. Um, what kinds of responses do you expect? You know, another 30 years into the future, 100 years into the future, what do you think this trend is going to show us? Yeah, that's a good question. I'm not exactly sure. I mean, I can tell you what happened in 30 years of warming um, because that's kind of our look into the future. This is the big idea, is that we're warming these for 30 years with the idea that maybe in 30 years, the control soil will look something like this. And that's been the interesting challenge actually of doing this. So, you know, over this 30 years of warming, our baseline is also moving. Um, and so we're always having to kind of prepare because the, the landscape is shifting. But so far, um, what it looks like is the bacteria in the heated plots are better able to decompose the carbon that is left. Um, and so that makes sense, right? They're, they're, they've improved their capacity to degrade what little is left. We have an undergraduate right now who's looking at um, this question about competition. So if there's less food, um, are microbes competing more for what's remaining? Um, maybe making more antibiotics or having more competition? Um, so that's something that we don't know yet. Um, we looked at how they grow in relation to temperature. And um, interestingly, their temperature sensitivity, this is another uh, undergraduate project of who, person who just graduated. The temperature sensitivity did not change. Uh, this is something that was noticed for the communities, that the community temperature sensitivity did change. So I mean by temperature sensitivity is, I told you if you warm a system, it, the, the rate of respiration increases. So if you measure how much it increases, that's the temperature sensitivity. And so 
in the communities and in the soil, the temperature sensitivity um, is lower for communities. So you heat them up and they don't change as much. But for the individual bacteria, we did not see a change. Their temperature optima is higher. So they prefer a higher temperature, even though how they respond to temperature in their growth doesn't change. That is so cool. Yeah. That is so cool. Um, so to kind of wrap up this vignette, um, this research, as you kind of mentioned, took place over several decades at this long-term research site. Can you speak to the importance of doing long-term research at sites like this and uh, how the results from studies like these might differ from some of the shorter-term studies that we tend to do? Oh, well, I mean, th this is kind of a, well, it's not a completely unique resource, but there are not a lot of resources like this. Um, something I didn't mention, but our work is supported by, in part by the National Science Foundation, and they have this program called Long-Term Ecological Research, LTER. And there are, I don't know how many, something like 15 maybe LTERs in the country. And Harvard Forest is one of them. And it's this funding program specifically intended to support this kind of long-term study. Because there are just some things that you can't understand in a, a shorter time frame. Um, so I do periodically uh, go to Washington, D.C. and talk to my uh, representatives and senators about the importance of funding this kind of long-term research and what a wonderful um, resource it is, not just for science, but for training students and uh, building up our, our networks um, and our sort of technological ability to understand these systems in the first place. That is awesome. That's so cool. Okay, so to kind of wrap up our second vignette, we'll open our questions again to the audience. If you guys have any more questions about this section, we'd be happy to take them. Yeah, Jenna. I have one from on Zoom. Um, they said that if the heating tables that you talked about, they're buried and only heating the soil, does that accurately reflect what our like ambient warming is actually going to be? Because wouldn't the air temperature also have impacts on what's happening to the soil? Yeah. Ooh, that's that's a really good question. By saying um, that work, um, but we're all just people. This <laughs> 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 is what we can do. It is a it's a limitation. Um, and actually, there are three warming experiments happening, and one of them is shutting down this summer because they're they're hard to run. They're expensive, even though we're still only looking at. Um, you know, the below ground. One of the other, like we're only heating partial root um, areas. So we only look in soil. We can't really understand trees or larger organisms. We can't look at insects because they can migrate. It definitely has its limitations. This is where working in the lab um, can be useful. Uh, but then in the, you know, in the complete other end of the spectrum, Department of Energy, which has funded some other of our work, um, has also supported this other project called SPRUCE. And I think SPRUCE might be an acronym and I don't remember what it stands for. But um, SPRUCE is a warming experiment, kind of like Harvard Forest, but they're heating underground and they've built these giant 60 foot high greenhouses around stands of trees. Mm -hmm. It is bananas. And so they're heating whole stands of trees and underground to try and understand this question. Um, it's a huge endeavor. It's like the CERN of ecology. It's nuts. Wow. Yeah. That's amazing. So yeah, it's a it's a caveat of our work. Definitely. Cool. Cool. Yeah. Called, where is this and how long has it been in effect? The Spruce project? Spruce? Um, Spruce is in Washington State. And it's been running for like kind of eight years. That's a guess. Does anybody know? Yeah, something like that. It's newer. Yeah. Yes. Uh, so you mentioned that um, carbon rich soils hold water better. And it, my question is why is that? Is it related to the work of stuff organic matter and that pool that you're talking about? Why that carbon rich soils hold water? Ooh, I forgot to repeat the question oh, for Zoom, oh, but yeah. uh, why do carbon-rich soils hold water better? 
Um, so more carbon rich soils have more organic matter and it's, they just, it's just acts like a sponge. Yeah. So it's partly organic matter. And I know we have some soil people in the room. So it's partly clays. Clays have layers and the water can store in between the layers. Um, and so that might be another reason that if you have more water, you, the layers can expand and contract. Um, but the organic matter, it's just, it's just sticks to it. Um, following up on that, that earlier question, I mean, another thing you can't mimic so well at Harvard Forest is that I assume they did not uh, raise the temperature in a gradual fashion, which is what we're actually seeing. So yeah. the microbes don't have a long length of time to adapt. So, so I, I assume it was a sudden five degree. Yeah, they just, they just turned it on and flipped the switch. Yeah. So I'm wondering how significant you think that might be in the microbes' response. Yeah, so how significant is it to have a fast temperature switch instead of a slow, gradual one? Yeah, that's a good question. But it's hard to answer, you know, without doing an experiment. I mean, what I can say is, you know, I know that there are lots of studies doing this kind of warming, like we in this experiment, we're heating through these buried resistance cables. People will sometimes put up passive heating elements, like, um, what are they called? Like the little glass houses. I'm blanking on what they're called, but it just looks like a little greenhouse with an open top chamber. Um, and that will heat the soil like a degree or two. Um, there are also uh, sometimes people will hang these heaters to, to sort of radiate heat to the ground. And those two methods heat less. And then you sometimes just don't see as much of an effect. I mean, we're heating five degrees. And the temperature range uh, that the soils experience between winter and summer is between maybe minus 10 and 25 degrees. So there's a 35 degree range and we're heating only five, just to give like a context of what that's like. Yeah. So you're right, it's, I mean, the whole thing is unnatural. But maybe, yeah, maybe fossil fuels are too. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. So just um, thinking about his question, how long do the microbes live? The individual microbes. How long do microbes live? Such a so good question. Is it new yeah. microbes all the time? That's what I'm thinking. Yeah, it is new microbes all the time. So we have a we have like a community average measurement of how often the microbes live. So how long a microbe lives? It's a little complicated, right? Because it, when a microbe is alive. It divides. Now it has two daughter cells, and the original cell is not there anymore, kind of in the new cell. Um, and so our what we measure is that it's every two weeks. That's a community average. So on average, every two weeks, there's a whole new set of microbes. Except they're not new because they're um, they've divided. divided. Yeah. But then if they divide too much, the contribution of the original microbe gets smaller and smaller, mm -hmm. doesn't it? Well, there's no original microbe, it's, it's all that's new. Well, I know. <laughs> yeah. So here, so I want you to think about another another idea. Um, and this came from Melissa, who's here, the good idea. Um, so we, we talked a little bit, uh, um, Ed brought up about necromass. I don't know if people know what this is, but I'd like to explain it just because it's a cool idea. So I told you that over this experiment, the number of microbes doesn't really change. So imagine over the course of a season, right? We're just getting into our growing season. April, we'll go right into November. Every two weeks, we got uh, the microbes that are there are doubling. But over the course of the season, the total number doesn't change. So what's happening to half the microbes every two weeks? They're dying either through predation or they're lysing or they get a viral infection or they run out of food um, and they, they become the new organic matter. Can they get eaten? Yeah. Yeah, they oh, can that's get, predation. yeah, that's predation, sorry. Yeah, they get eaten. And so that's partly what is the new organic matter. And so this idea that microbes are the soil organic matter, not like undecomposed plant material, is a relatively new one to science. Well, maybe in the last 10 years, people have appreciated that, that dead microbes are building soil. But what about the fungus that went away? 
Didn't you say that the fungus yeah. material disappeared more? The, yeah, the fungal biomass is is lower. Yeah. So did the mice have a demon? Uh, the dead fungi? Probably some of them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, I love last of us. I just ate that vegetable. <laughs> <laughs> oh, good. Is, is there any plant cover on uh, ground cover on either of those two plots, or has that changed over time as far as like feeding exudates to keep part of the community going? Yeah, there's good ground cover in all the plots. I mean, oh, we don't okay. plant anything. It's right, just but, natural. Natural. but you do have some, yeah. so that, that's tough on you. There's plants, huh. yeah. But you'd expect the heat would encourage the plant cover. I mean, on uh, certain times of the year, anyways. Yeah, I, well, it, it's definitely extending the growing season, yeah. and, and that's what we're yeah. seeing in our natural climate change progression as well. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I just have one quick question from Zoom. Um, are you able to actually monitor if the species of the bacteria is changing over the time? Ooh, can you What's monitor how the species of bacteria is changing? So we can. The species definition for microbes is a little... Um, well, contentious, I guess, um, but we can assign species, and that's part. That's one of the things that we do with sequencing. Is um, there are some genes that everybody has, me and you, and our mitochondria, and all the bacteria and archaea, um, and those genes are unique, and we can sequence those genes and kind of assign a, a species name. It's a taxonomy, just say what it is. And so when I was saying that the community change was different, that's what I meant. Like species. The fungi were different and the species of bacteria weren't that different. And it matters because more closely related organisms tend to share more functions. And so we do community ecology, not because we care about, you know, Fred or Margaret or whatever the microbes names are, but because they do certain things. Um, and so, so yeah, that is, that is something that we do. Awesome. Okay, so with that, we're going to move into our final vignette of the evening. Um, so how did you start working on climate change and microbial ecology? And what kind of inspired you to start down this, this path? You're a dread. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, that's a good question. So like I discovered microbiology first. My students have heard the story. It's like process of elimination. I was just looking for something to do and I liked science and I discovered microbiology and I thought they were really cool. And that was my thing. And then um, it was about that same time that I kind of like woke up to climate change and sort of realized that this is not, um, you know, this is something I should pay attention to. It's something that's affecting everybody and it's gonna affect all of our uh, social systems and ecosystems. And uh, I spent a long time um, trying to figure out how I could study microbes, which I love, and climate change, which I care about. And um, at the time, I was a postdoc, like thinking about these things. And uh, I was working, I was, well, I was working in UC Berkeley, but we had field sites and collaborators in Puerto Rico. And I was flying to Puerto Rico. I'm feeling awful about my carbon footprint. and. Um, so, and I, I'm actually from Massachusetts. I grew up in Watertown. My parents still live there. They might be watching. <laughs> and, uh, and so, so I really wanted to, to come back to Massachusetts. I always wanted to live here. And then when I came to visit UMass, I got to visit Harbor Forest and we have this wonderful LTER like 30 miles away. Um, I thought, this is amazing. And so it's just like this kind of confluence of like, you know, what I'm interested in and what I want to do. And, um, you know, soils are so special and they need protecting. And um, actually, I'm, I'm going to I'm going to be a little bit of a stickler for a moment um, because uh, we all these are the dirty details. Dirt is soil where it does not belong. There, I said it. <laughs> nah, we can all relax. <laughs> 
do you have any advice for any individual that's interested in this topic or suggestions for any ways that they could find some opportunities? For people who are interested in this topic. Um, so, I mean, I'm, I'm pretty passionate about soil conservation and that it's a real like personal responsibility. And I think everybody has some uh, soil in their life that they could take better care of. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, here's a few things like, Having a lawn isn't the worst thing. It's not the best, but if you really want to have a lawn, um, maybe don't cut it so short, or maybe set aside part of your lawn and plant some wildflowers so that you can encourage pollinators. Um, planting anything at any time is good. Um, don't dig up your uh, you know, invasive plants or your non-native plants to plant native ones. There was a great study by, I think it was Bethany Bradley's group a few years ago that said 70% um, is, is the number. Uh, if you have something like 70% natives, that's still, you're doing fine. So there's a lot of ornamentals that aren't native, they're fine. Um, so that's what I would say, like, take care of your soil. Don't have bare patches, plant some flowers, maybe don't mow the whole thing, have a garden, like take care of your, take care of your space. Compost. And composting, yeah. I would love for Amherst to have municipal composting. Those are okay. good. Yeah, that would be great. I'll look forward to my compost that I get delivered. <laughs> Uh, and what would you say for um, new students that are interested in kind of taking the path you took? My path was super non-linear. Um, so I don't know. I'm, I mean, and a lot of it was luck and a lot of it was just kind of being patient with like the fact that I didn't have my acts together for a really long time. So I don't know if I, it's hard to give advice because I'm not sure I would advise to do exactly what I did. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but uh, I took a lot of years off in between everything actually. Um, and I talked to a lot of different people. And so that was, that's probably good advice is just talk to a lot of different people, especially you students, graduate students and undergraduate students Every door on campus is open for you. People are waiting literally to talk to you. All you have to do is ask. And so I know it like can feel hard and you're like, feel like you're bothering them. You're not bothering anybody. Like we want to talk to you. People want to talk to you. It changes once you graduate as a postdoc. And then as you get older, you be, it becomes more your responsibility to mentor. But while you're a student, now is the time. You can send any email to anybody and ask any question. <laughs> and so you should take advantage of that. Um, and that was, I mean, that was what I did. When I was looking for graduate programs, I probably sent a hundred letters to people. Just, hi, your science looks cool. Can you talk to me? And like most people ignore me, that's fine. But like I learned a lot and that's how I, that's how I sort of ended up here. Yeah, I think that's such valuable advice because it can seem very intimidating to go knock on all those doors as a student, but that is so valuable. Um, so switching gears just a little bit, um, although the evidence of climate change is all around us, um, there's many of us that don't work directly with climate change, um, but we still kind of feel this, this anxiety about it. Um, your lab is in very close proximity to the issue. Um, and we were wondering if your lab group stress and some of the ways that you let off some of that stress. That's a good question. I mean, I personally struggle with climate related stress. Um, and I'm not sure I I don't I don't exactly know how to deal with. I mean, I think part of the way that I deal with it is I changed my whole life so I could work on climate change. Uh, you know, that was one way. Um, I do some volunteer work and, and that helps me feel better about climate change. Um, I've done some get out for vote work with the 500 women scientists, which we were talking about. And um, I work with the uh, MSP union. So it's a mass society of professors um, is 
sort of help to organize this multi-union initiative so that um, like PSU and, and GEO and the undergrads um, and with Sunrise and a bunch of different groups, we have this um, group called ESAM, which is an Environmental Social Action Movement. And the idea is this is the new like a climate justice committee. Um, but instead we're a group, we use uh, something called sociocracy, which is just a way of sort of distributed group decision-making through consensus and conversation. Um, and we work on things like um, voting is the circle I'm involved in right now. We're also working on uh, transportation and trying to make transportation more green. We're working on um, I think plastics uh, on campuses on hold. We're working on banking. You probably, that group is very active and you've probably heard about some of the work they're doing to try and get the um, sort of fossil fuel enabling banks off of campus and get campus to do more to sort of divest their financial portfolio from some of this fossil fuel emission stuff. And then we do a bit of outreach too. So that's been really actually cool, like good way of feeling like I'm not just I don't know. I definitely get the feeling sometimes. I don't know if my students do of like, you know, I'm studying microbes because they're cool and there's all of this stuff happening in the world and maybe I feel a bit disconnected. So, I mean, we're thinking about it every day and I feel disconnected. So uh, I, I think those feelings are unavoidable. Um, and then maybe part of it is just like the best sort of way of dealing with it is just to have a good time anyways. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. I love that. Um, we talked about this briefly earlier, but I wanted to touch on it again. Um, some of your research has been funded by the Department of Energy, you mentioned the National Science Foundation, uh, which means that in part you're funded through taxpayer dollars. Uh, which is a great way to get science funded. But can you talk a little bit more about what being federally funded means as a scientist uh, and what that entails and um, how that kind of overlaps with your own mission and goals? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so our lab is supported only through federal funding right now. So it's Department of Energy and National Science Foundation. And um, the way it works is a little bit different for the two National Science Foundation. Their mission is research, research and training. And so, you know, I mentioned that some of my students are here and there was a picture of some of the students, like dozens of people, not just me, have been working on this and have contributed to um, thinking of new ideas and developing them uh, and actually physically doing the work. Um, writing our papers, mentoring younger students. Um, and so, so that's the National Science Foundation. And then Department of Energy has a little bit more of a specific mission, um, or, or at least those programs have more of a specific mission. But for both programs, the idea is that, you know, we come up with a, a research topic that we're interested in. Um, we write it up as a grant proposal um, and talk about not just what we're going to do, but how we're going to know if it works and who's going to do it and how are those folks going to be supported and um, what are the things that we're going to do to make sure that everybody knows about this work that we do, not just publishing, but um, going to professional meetings and coming to things like this and talking to high schools and, and middle school students. Um, and in fact, you know, we get these budgets um, and about half, a little more than half, goes to the university. It's called overhead, and it's just, you know, it pays, like, janitorial staff and uh, facility needs and all of that. Um, but then the rest of it that I get, almost all of that goes to support students and postdocs and undergrad workers in the lab. So a lot of that money, I mean, it looks like science, but a lot of it really is new, new scientists. That's so awesome. Um, so our next, next question is, tomorrow is Trans Day of Disability. Um, could you possibly share the work of some trans scientists that you admire? 
Yeah. Yeah. So there are two, um, there are two people who are out and trans who are scientists who I want to mention. And there's not a lot of out and trans scientists. And I know that uh, people are, are discovering their uh, sexuality and gender identity all the time. But so I'll talk about um, two. So one um, is named uh, Dr. Micah Tosca. I don't know if anybody was at AGU and saw Dr. Tosca's talk. Dr. Tosca is a climate scientist and artist. And her work specifically explores like how art can help in science and science communication. Um, and she just like, she's a wonderful science communicator. Um, and uh, she's at the College of the um, Chicago Art Institute. I can't even remember what college. Mm -hmm. Definitely want to work there. <laughs> um, so I would say that that's, that's one person because I love this intersection of art and science to kind of use art as a way of conveying ideas or making science seem more um, relatable. And then the other person I want to mention is a new member of our UMass community. Um, and her name is Dr. Anna Marie Lachance, and she's in chemical engineering, and she's a new lecturer. And we haven't actually met yet, but we're having coffee next week. You're watching Anna the <laughs> um, And we we share a lot of the same passions um, in terms of um, uh, expanding access for learning um, to uh, broaden the ability for people to learn in lots of different communities. Um, trans rights are human rights. Science is something that should be for everybody. Um, and anyway, those are two people that I like. Yeah. Wonderful, wonderful. Um, with that, that concludes the end of vignette three. So, if there are any more audience questions, we'd love to take them. Yeah. Yeah. Hi, uh, one from Zoom. Um, do you have any advice for folks who have environmental backgrounds but want to find a way to get into this type of research without going back to grad school? Ooh, so do you have recommendations for people that are in environmental work to keep going but not go back to grad school? Um, that's a good question. Let me think about that. You know, there are resources available through our society. So I know in particular, like the Ecological Society of America has professional resources, um, like uh, certificate programs um, and American Society for, Biology, for Microbiology, ASM, also has resources on their website. So I'd probably start with our professional societies um, in terms of environmental science. The only other thing I, I can think of um, is I got involved a little bit with the Ecological Landscape Alliance. Um, I've lost track of them through the pandemic, but that's a local group who's made up of land managers um, and uh, land stewards and people who are sort of in charge of um, environmental decisions. Um, and they're really passionate about science um, and ecology. Uh, and they have a lot of great um, learning uh, materials on their website. They have a newsletter, they have a conference. Um, so it, those are some resources that I know about. Is there like citizen science? Are there citizen science projects that people can get involved in? Ooh, are there citizen science projects that people can get involved with? I wish I had one to tell you, but I don't know of one. I'm sure that there are. Do you know? Oh, yeah. Okay. Uh, just a coincidence. I was um, looking at a citizen science project yesterday that involves iNaturalist, um, which is an app like training right. for identification, valorization of the wildlife we have here. And they're having actually this month, this month of April, um, a project in partnership with the Mount Grace. I forget the full name, but the, res the reservation. Um, so they're gonna have nature walks to train people on how to use this and contribute to the generation of uh, data with the citizen science and also have these nature walks through public and private property to look at um, the wildlife that comes out during the spring. So that's something that would be cool to check out. Was that through the UMass libraries? Yes. 
It was an email from the UMass Library. It was an email from the UMass Libraries, but I think it, the program itself is. Yeah. yeah Actually, I'd love to also direct people back to the Harvard Forest. They have a big education component. Um, and so there are resources on their website. There are public talks. Well, there's also the, there's that one section of the National Science Institute, National Science Foundation, and that is devoted to broadening impact. And so there must be people who know about many different fields that have um, citizen science type projects. Uh, remember Julian, whatever his name is, the rice, the arsenic rice? <laughs> you don't remember this? Yeah. <laughs> what was Julian thinking? <laughs> but I know I did some of the, I did one of the experiments when my daughter finished. She said, Oh, thanks, mom. You put some arsenic in my pots. <laughs> <laughs> But um, he had people measuring the arsenic in rice and sending it in um, electronically, and then they used it for experiments. Tyson, really nice. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and I was so glad you gave such a big um, natural boost to water. Yeah. <laughs> Um, we noticed that you have plankton on your website from SpongeBob. And we were wondering, we included that in a poster, and we're wondering why you have plankton on your website. Yeah, so what's your connection to plankton from SpongeBob? <laughs> well, I mean, SpongeBob is amazing. Yes, and hilarious. I don't know of another sort of microbe that's also a comedy giant. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think there's another one. I'd love to know if there is. But also, I find Plankton kind of hilarious because he's constantly failing, even though his plots are nefarious, because he's acting alone. Mm -hmm. Microbes are meant to be in communities. <laughs> yeah. uh, I have a question about um, microplastic in the soil. When I was working like about it, and are there certain microbes that release plastic that are going to stay left in the future? <laughs> well, okay. So the question is, uh, what about microplastics in soil, and is there any way that microbes could potentially eat them yeah. in the future? So um, there are plastics in soil and everywhere. Um, there are microbes that can eat the plastics. But as far as I know, there aren't a lot of microbes eating plastics in the soil because they have better things to eat. <laughs> so plastics do break down, um, but part of that decomposition is um, called like abiotic, like it's um, you know through uh, UV degradation or physical shearing of the pieces of plastic, not so much microbes eating it. I know that some people are working on trying to Sort of engineer microbes to eat more plastics, um, and uh, it's a it's a tricky kind of science because even just finding the plastics um, is is difficult. If you were to sort of go out, I mean, I don't know. I bought compost locally and found plastic in it. Um, I don't know if you can buy compost without plastic in it. It's just everywhere. Um, so. I hope that we can figure out a way of composting plastics to get rid of them. But um, you know, the bad news is plastics now are starting to lithify. People are finding rocks made of plastic. Um, it sounds like a good piece of it. I mean, could be a good way. It just makes them harder to get rid of. I don't know. Yeah, maybe they're less. Less reactive. I mean, they're so they're so non nutritious. Yeah. <laughs> I know that's why it's hard to get microbes to eat them. Right. <laughs> yeah. And if they did eat them, they die. Right. Well, micro. There's a microbe to eat everything. Um, they might not want to eat it. Might have to force them to eat it. <laughs> you wouldn't want them to go wild. Right. And all of a sudden, yeah. your siding on your house is disappearing. Right. <laughs> okay. Oh, yeah. 
just before we go, if you wouldn't mind, if you had to like summarize the most significant findings from your Harvard study in like one statement, what would it be? Ooh, if you had to summarize the most important findings in your Harvard study, what would it be? Okay. So the long term warming is causing this loss of soil carbon by a third, but the microbes seem to be adapting to lessen the decrease of carbon over, uh, over climate change time. So this adaptation that we're talking about, this, this evolution of microbes and what they can do seems to be kind of swinging in this direction of, of mitigating part of the problem. So that's the good news. Okay, with that, we would like to thank you again so much for being with us. This was such an awesome, you. This awesome awesome. conversation. Um, and thank you guys all for joining us as well. Um, look for emails or on our social media about our next event, which will be next month with Dr. Jess or Sony here at Amherst Women's Club, as well as virtually on Zoom. You can also check out our website um, for more information about all of our, our various events. And if you haven't already, please don't forget to fill out either the virtual sign-in sheet or the sign-in sheet that we've got kind of over there at the front of the room so that we can continue to give you guys updates on what we're doing next. And with that, have a great evening, everybody.